little sort of brief of Mindhunter was the, that it's set in the late 70s. Um, it's about uh, the FBI, were the, some of the first people in the FBI to study serial killers. Um, so instantly, uh, in the first season, for me, that instantly brought to mind uh, both serial killers, the 70s. So work that David had already done in that department uh, would have been uh, The Zodiac, uh, which is a masterful piece of work. Um, I didn't receive a, a specific brief uh, from Fincher. And so for me, it was just about uh, referring probably to the Zodiac, to that era. Coming from photography, some of my personal references are still photographers like William Eggleston, uh, Stephen Shore. And these are photographers that use uh, color as sort of almost a subject. They're opportunistic photographers who just look at light uh, a lot as a subject as well. But mostly light and color, uh, I find. Um, and that was sort of the initial sort of approach. So as I, I started receiving uh, shots and whatnot, I sort of took the, this, these as my starting point. Then I sort of learned a bit later that he was a big fan of um, all, all the president's men. And you can see some similarities uh, between all the president's men and here, the Zodiac, you know, the newsroom, uh, and here in maybe in the color palette between this, the, this one and this one. Um, I'm toggling between the Zodiac and the, the, all the President's Men. So David Fincher, uh, in both seasons actually, he directed maybe about three or four episodes each time. But it's important to note that he's, as the executive producer, he, he really has a hand in the entire post-production process. So everything you see is sort of controlled by him, especially also in the grade. Um, he's the final eyes and decision maker on all episodes. Uh, the, the show is shot on a red camera. Um, in the first season was a dragon sensor. Second season was a helium sensor. And it's important to know that uh, David uh, has no DIT on set and no on set colorist as well. He likes to just shoot and get what he shot in dailies very directly. Um, we transcoded everything right from the R3D right into 16-bit open, uh, OpenEXR files, which are very heavy um, but have it, their advantages in that we can um, send uh, high-res media directly to visual effects. And I can start grading, essentially, on the same files. And I can receive visual effects shots back with alpha channels, uh, as many as I want. Um, it, we graded in um, the first season in Red Log Film, second <coughs> season in ACES CCT. And the choice of that was really kind of just, you know, we switched to full-on ACES color spaces in season two. And the choice of that was really just kind of aesthetic. You know, David really hates uh, the color pink. And we were just, we threw up I IPP2, which is Red, Red's uh, color science that was coming out at the beginning of season two. We had shot with dragon color. And we just put that, those two up against aces in terms of just transcoding directly into aces and into that co those color spaces. And we just happened to like uh, the fact that Aces was a bit, had a bit more uh, maybe color saturation, uh, a bit more color separation, and a, bit, and a bit less pink. So let's get into more of the, uh, the look of Mindhunter. This is from season one, and uh, like I said, he gave me no direct brief, right? But uh, we were watching this scene early on, and he stopped me and said, you know what, I, I love this shot, I love all the gamma detail, you, the, nothing is crushed even underneath the staircase. I love the fact that you can see uh, that this color of, uh, you know, his jacket is blue, this is charcoal gray, these are different colors. Th the point to me, that what I took away from that was that he wants a, a nice a realistic look, a low contrast look. And so there's no big color grade, for, for example, you know, you can, you're always going to be able to tell the differences in colors, even very subtle differences, you know, between the color of this sort of uh, olive-ish car, olive gray and the uh, tonal ranges start to melt into each other or become crushed. So no bigger or garish grade. Well, of course not garish, but no big grade. You know, this is, he, he really does not want a colorist sitting in front of him who uh, thinks he's going to win an Academy Award for his color. Uh, it needs to be much more subtle and backgrounded uh, for David because he really has his very specific look in his mind. And uh, he would probably get that from any one of us, you know, sitting at the base light. He could easily tell you exactly what to do and, and get what he wants. David, uh, early on, um, sort of uh, 
you know, was looking at HDR scenes uh, and uh, quickly realizing that for him, a lot of it was distracting, you know, the, the, the fact that uh, especially some of these light sources could be so much more prominent, you know, than really was intended. For example, in this scene, it's shot very brilliantly. So here it's shot from below, you know, the camera's uh, linked to a dolly on the, uh, it's a long shot. And it's really great they walk through the supermarket. But here, uh, David was not at all interested in showing you anything about the, you know, those neon lights behind them, uh, and, which is something you can do in HDR. You can impart a sense of anxiety or whatnot to a scene uh, if something bad's about to happen or there's something that's really, really wrong. But this was the case for a lot of scenes. So what he sort of determined the speed limit of our HDR to be around 600 nits. And even in something like this, probably those neons are maybe around 300. I don't know, let's go read. But in any case, there's a difference between that and that. This HDR grade, being on a uh, period piece was going to sort of meet the periodness of it sort of halfway in the middle uh, and that it was not going to be, a, uh, HDR was not something that was going to push David into some new uh, universe or new, new gamma space. Um, he's very, very specific about skin tones and about wanting to keep them nice and, how would you say, matte as opposed to saturated. So. In terms of HDR, I, I developed this curve to just put right on to the, right from the start, which is in PQ. I don't know if any of you are familiar, or some, some people might not be familiar with it, but it's not a linear um, a gamma space. It's a, it's a log encoded gamma space, so that here you would have, uh, at around 50%, you would have what's, what we're tr used to seeing in, in standard definition. But up here, it gets exponentially bigger, uh, so that up here you have 10,000 nits. And in here you have maybe 5,000, and here's 2,000. And this is 100 nits up to, up to the 50% mark. Then uh, this is close to the real world, actually. You know, uh, light, uh, the way it's captured by the sensor and the way our eyes see it, we're, we're, our eyes are much more evolved to want to see things right in here. And all of this is daylight. When you walk outside, you've got 100,000. Uh, no, maybe not, maybe 40,000, between 20 and 40,000 nits of luminous intensity in, in, in daylight. And in this room, we might have, I don't know, let, let's say we have 100 in this room. Well, that's a huge difference. And so that's why you need this log encoded gamma curve to preserve all of this detail if you want it in the, in the clouds, uh, but knowing full well that we're, we're looking down here. So I developed this curve to kind of say, we're never going to go. We're never going to want 2,000 nits anyways, because he gave me a speed limit of uh, 600. As far as the trim pass goes, uh, you know, I worked on the HDR master. And uh, for me, it was very straightforward. I would just analyze the whole scene using the Dolby Vision tools that are embedded in uh, Baselight now, thankfully. And most of the time, I just had a bit of a lift. You know, this setting right here is probably the setting that's on 90% of the show. Just a lift of, after the analysis, a lift of the, in the blacks. And then I was pretty much done. A lot of the other stuff, if I ever needed to tweak this uh, Dolby Pass, um, would be maybe in the gain for things like clouds. Um, Again, the, for those who aren't familiar, when you work in HDR, you need to, in order to develop a, an SDR uh, image, which is the image we're all used to seeing on our iPads and our, on our laptops and whatnot, you need, to ha you need to transcode it into that space. And Dolby has a way of doing that automatically uh, on a per shot basis. And you just set it and you go get a coffee and 40 minutes later your episode has been analyzed and you could potentially just render it out and send it to somebody on Pix or on... So, much was improved in the second season. The transcoding from uh, HDR into uh, SDR so that I could send David a ProRes in Pittsburgh because he did a lot, a lot, a lot of color notes just looking at his iPad. Even though I was uh, grading in HDR, I had to render those out in SDR to send to him. And uh, in order to do that in the season one, it was quite complicated because the Dolby uh, analysis tools were external. You had to do command line rendering of those using the Dolby analysis, the XML. Um, and so I, I, I wrote uh, another thing to, uh, transcode, and these were, my, these were my lines of code every night when I wanted to render uh, specific frame ranges using the Dolby tools. But thankfully that's all integrated now in, in Baselight. So if you're doing, if you're doing uh, HDR now, you just hit 
render and you get a ProRes in SDR and you're so happy and uh, it's much less pain. In terms of the, the look of the show, so the look of the show needed to refer to an arrow, which it was, uh, he wanted it to refer to what's quote unquote called the widescreen anamorphic era. For those who aren't familiar with what the word anamorphic means, um, this is a widescreen uh, you know, piece of film uh, that was shot on a 35 millimeter, let's say. Part of the film being exposed is just this right here. That's it. And this is all lost. Here there's an optical you know, soundtrack, so even that's being lost. So people invented lenses that would squeeze the image so you could use the vertical aspect, the vertical axis of the 35 millimeter frame, with the, the fact being that if you were then to stretch it back out with an anamorphic projector, that you would benefit from this resolution, this, gain, this resolution that's gained there on the vertical axis, and it would look, um, it would look sharper. So it's a way of making widescreen things in a still on a limited format. So this, this look is what we wanted to refer to because this produced all these weird things um, that uh, are, were kind of signatures of that era. So here you have like the, the I guess it's the parallax view. Uh, the, again, the parallax view. So you can see like this, uh, you know, these lines are supposed to, supposed to be straight. You get these in wide angle lenses already, but in anamorphic you get these certain things that happen such as this, this uh, slight curve there on the top of the frame. You get things like chromatic aberration, so there's a little bit of blue there, cyan, a little bit of magenta there. This is because the, the lenses are doing so much to the image to squeeze them that the, the glass can't perfectly align, so you get chromatic aberration, you get weird things like uh, oval-shaped bokeh, you get squeezing on the edges of the, uh, of the frame, so these guys are quite thin. Um, uh, this is, uh, it's Close Encounters, actually. Uh, and you get people, you know, framing for, for widescreen as well. You know, you got action taking place on the extreme left, on the, on the extreme right. And so these, these things about the squeezing here and about the, uh, the sort of warping there, David wanted to reproduce um, uh, in post. And it fell to me on the base light because we got a base light X and, well, there's all this muscle in there, and so, hey, Eric, why don't you do that? Uh, you can do that, right? Uh, David shoots uh, on a you know, full frame, 6K, it, the, it was 6K uh, in season one and 8K in season two, but in season two, we transcoded that, six, that 8K to 6K. But this center extraction, the white part there, is what the crop of Mindhunter looks like. And so that allows us, this is, the, this is the portion that we'll be using, so that allows us to then when we apply these lens warps, you see how the, the edges of the frame are moving in. We had three settings and they needed to be linked to the actual um, lens used on set. And David's shooting with uh, Leica Summilux Primes, uh, that lens metadata didn't carry through to the metadata of the file, so it was tallied by the assistants. And Eric had to learn Python in order to, um, in order to merge those lens, the, 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 that lens information into the XML. Um, somewhere in here, there's a lens value. And I use that to then, once it's conformed in base light, to sort the timeline according to the, the focal length. The, the, uh, you know, I put it in the name field there. And so I could sort the timeline according to the strip name and then apply one of those three settings. Season one, uh, I, uh, we had to have, this is, this is, these are my layers for making a chromatic aberration for David Fincher. Uh, that does not include the color magenta because he hates pink. So, you know, normally when you, when you have 99% a, a, a of the chromatic aberration filters out there just offset one of the, the, the channels. So if you take the red channel, you, 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 you offset it a little bit. You get red on one side and cyan on the other. Well, he didn't want the red, so I had to do a difference mat in here somewhere. But the, the, what I'm trying to say is that in the first season, we had this whole lens uh, effects timeline. So I did all the color in one scene. And then we would render that out uh, and bring it into the lens effects uh, scene and then render that out. And in season two, I didn't have to do that. I could have everything in the same, uh, the same scene because we also had grain, a grain added in there and also a tiny bit of, of gate weave. Yeah. 
These are outtakes, by the way, sound outtakes that did not appear in Line Hunter that the uh, composer was glad, uh, have, uh, gracious enough to give me, uh, Jason um, Hill. Dropping Pew's body at a site we've searched is a way of inserting himself in the investigation. We've seen this before. Kemper, BTK, Berkowitz, they love to be the only ones at the table playing with a full deck. All right. What do we do? He's responding to media coverage. We need to strictly manage what we give them. That way we're focusing him to respond to the right things. So this is how we start sort of, uh, this is the raw image and then a bit more low, lower contrast. But as you can see here, once we, when we start from here to, when we sort of the camera pans right, um, and you can see that uh, something's not quite right because this, this whole side of the room, oh yeah, this whole side of the room here is all smoked out. This side is all clipped actually, uh, or not clipped, but it looks crunched in the blacks. And that, this was, uh, you know, the use of smoke machines on Line Hunter was, is, uh, was prevalent. And so a lot of what I ended up needing to do was to, once I put my, you know, this is a gamma that I did to, to uh, you know, get it inter into the, the range that we wanted. But, you know, you, you, you make masks, and on the inside of that, I'm essentially, uh, you know, uh, Bringing up the blacks there with the you know the base light uh, gr uh, base base grade, um, the flare I used a lot to deal with this kind of smoky problem, uh, and on the outside just kind of starting to gamma down, uh, and then uh, to basically harmonize the the scene and get the, get rid of that smoke. And we really had this in every you know any, any of these long interviews with the uh, the um, you know the serial killers. Uh, we, uh, there was a lot of smoke basically to deal with. And as a colorist, well, that's, that's part of your job is to um, make things look like they were uh, completely consistent. And so that was a lot of Mindhunter. Um, for one, same thing here where, you know, he's probably, maybe he had less there. And that's part of the problem. This here, you know, we, I talked about aces, the color space. It, it's actually, it, it made things very saturated, especially in the yellows. And we had to do a lot of sort of before and after here of just bringing the yellows into something more, less distracting um, and into the palette that David likes, which is, it, you could call it desaturated, but uh, he's always looking for skin tone in that desaturation. Um, you know, we did have to wrangle a lot of that Aces saturation. And it's not, maybe not inherent to Aces, but it's just an, uh, you know, we did notice a lot of it, uh, you know, transcoding directly uh, from the red sensor into the Aces color space. This one's kind of interesting. This is the initial shot right there. If I put a nice contrast on there because they're outdoors and it's supposed to be in the south. So we added this kind of yellow yellowness to everything that was taking place, you know, down in Atlanta um, in the show. This was something that had started already in season one. And Eric Messerschmidt, the, the, the DP, had a nice idea of sort of, he wanted it to sort of glow here. So I just pulled a key, a luminance key, you know, and blurred it so that when I then boost what's in the luminance key, you get this kind of glow because the, 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 the blurred key is basically going to bleed off the edges. And uh, that was just how we achieved that look. And what it did was to kind of give a, you know, it's like supposed they're by a river and it's in the south, it's supposed to be muggy. And uh, that maybe helps it to feel like uh, there's a lot more humidity in the air. And then what David did a lot uh, is just adding shadows, you know, 
uh, this is just a, a key to, I mean, what I have here is shapes uh, that are tracked. It looks a bit dodgy right now, but, um, uh, you know, these things are very subtle effects to just try to get shadow into the right places. And the reason I've keyed it there is just to remove, not be applying that to what's already shadow uh, to the blacks there. Here, the same thing of me, where, where are my shadow? That's the glow. And here, yeah, he, he, he actually drew these shapes, these very shapes are the ones that he drew in pics for me to draw. And he makes it quite simple, you know, because all I have to do is draw exactly where he, he said it. I have to track it. Um, but you'll see later it gets a bit hectic uh, because he, uh, I'll show you why. <laughs> he just has, you know, he can draw uh, one circle with one movement of the finger. So sometimes you have these, these, uh, these frames, these single frames with 36 circles in it. And you're like, do I have to do every single one of those? Um, you know, David's use of HDR is extremely subtle. You know, this is a day for night shots, which is always fun. For any colorist, it's like, this is what makes a colorist happy, to make this and have to make, oh, day for night, and we have to just make it really dark and add some blue. I mean, it feels like dusk and everything. It's really cool um, to be able to do that. But in terms of the HDR, you know, we're not, he, he, he wanted a, a very subtle version of HDR. He wasn't looking to make it all, uh, crazy, and uh, I w you know, here my intervention was to to go from uh, there to there, you know, just really subtle, you know. But that's the beauty of uh, you know, uh, that's his taste, and uh, the point is is that taste still applies in HDR, and it's not some uh, space where you need to go and everything's going to be disco and uh, crazy and wild and hitting people over the head. Um, not at all. And so I really, I really think David's kind of wise about that um, and, uh, and really uh, confident in, in his approach. You know there's something different about it, but you're still in the same universe you're used to seeing. I'm going to forward maybe here to... Oh yeah, maybe this scene, and then we'll get into some of his notes for fun. Um, uh, here, this is the original. So this is the original shot here, and there's supposed to be a helicopter overhead. Uh, they're arresting this guy here. There, he's getting arrested, poor guy. So we really just kind of turned on the lights and see them. Anyways, uh, that was fun uh, to really kind of boost that and make it feel like uh, really didn't take much, actually. So before and after. Let's move maybe to his notes. Step through them, you know. Tiny bit of cyan to match the next shot, that part of the ceiling, you know, let's match ceilings. David is very architectural. Uh, when he sees a space, he, you know, he, he'll, he'll, um, he'll, he'll take a wide shot of a space and say, okay, let's grade this, and then you're gonna time everything off of that, that shot. He very much is about um, consistency. So better match these walls, reference the middle of the previous shot, which was something around here, you know, make those walls uh, a bit more blue, uh, gray. And uh, he noticed, you know, right here, there's a bit of that wall there, you know. Uh, make sure it hasn't turned too cool, you know. Um, and David is really, really fractal about these things. Um, uh, I remember, I mean, I've done like door jam, you know, like hinges around doors, same olive, actually his word was putty. You know, this needs to be putty, we need to get it bang on in this whole scene. You know, here's the architectural thing, you know, like those shadows need to be matching. You know, it is brutal, it is brutal when you have entire scenes that you need to match with three different cameras. And some scenes, the, 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 the you know, the cameras are locked down, it's pretty great, you know, it's the same, same angle. Some scenes when they're moving around, it's like, uh, and because every angle you sort of need to really balance to match the other angle. Once he came into, uh, into Los Angeles, uh, uh, he would stop by now because the grading suite is just, you know, down the, down the you know, his office is right there. He'd stop by, pop in, but really, you know, he's, He's really, he, to him, it always looks amazing on the, the, uh, the, the BVM, right? He'll say, God, it looks great in here. But 
on on my on my monitor, this these this gamma is stretching too much and it's making it too saturated. And he hates uh, too much saturation, right? So he really want, does want a consumer device to, to look these. He does not trust the fact that this is what everybody in the world is going to see um, by any stretch. And I think he's right, actually. For me, uh, grading, I'm almost, it's really a little bit frustrating because I feel like I'm looking at this all the time and it's really tight and it's really compacted and it, sometimes it feels a bit flat. But he's right that if you put it on an LG OLED, uh, you know, it's going to stretch out, it's going to be really contrasty, and the colors are going to come up. And I think it travels well, his, his, uh, his approach. And I do, I, I, I do have an iPad that I render everything out to before I send it to him, so that, uh, you know, because I want to see what he's seeing, actually. And in season one, I actually did grade through the trim pass a bit because I really wanted to do have apples to apples. He was looking at SDR, making comments on SDR, so I actually turned off the HDR once I'd done the analysis and made the little fine tunes on the, right on the SDR live through the trim pass. Well, the early episodes I had maybe seven or eight rounds. Uh, the last episodes, it was pretty much David got two rounds of comments because the, we were getting really close to the deadline. But in one episode, you know, a typical episode might have 650 shots in it. You know, my first round of notes to David would easily come back with 500 notes, practically a note on every shot. Now, some of those are match, you know, or same as previous, which is cool because then I kind of whittle that down to maybe 350 notes. Yes, I do. I love base grade. Um, I have. Um, uh, I was talking to Daniele yesterday uh, about hope, hoping. I, I really, really love the concept of base grade, especially um, in the, you know the, the five zones plus the lift. I use the lift all the time to deal with smoke. Uh, it's brilliant. Um, I did tell him that for me, once you start getting contrasty, though, uh, that it tends to decontrast uh, and it gets quite charcoaly, you know. Um, and he said, well, there's a, there's a scientific reason for that, which is that uh, it, he doesn't want to change the ratios at all between the R, G, and B. Um, uh, but um, I'm hoping, because what I end up doing is resaturating, right, if I, if I contrast out um, to sort of counterbalance that. He might or might not, uh, you know, uh, give us another dial at some point. Um, I think that would approach more like if you take a curve, you know, curves and you do an S curve, uh, it has a very different look than if you try to do that same curve in base grade. And it's great to have multiple tools, you know, it's really cool. I take that as a compliment that it might look like a film. Um, we had grain, we had a lot of grain. Um, and that's about it, you know, I think it, it's because the look is so controlled, the color range is so controlled that you know unconsciously that whatever it is, it's very deliberate. And you know, film when it always had a certain look based on the, the stocks that you were using, you know, or the lab or whatnot. And so maybe film was a bit more controlled because of the processes used. Where I mean, you see shows nowadays, and the colors are really all over the place, um, which is fine. Um, but uh, he didn't ask me and say, you know what, I want this kind of film look. I want blue in the shadows. I want this. I want that. Uh, he did on the um, the the chase scene, where you know, with the, if you've seen the the scene where Holden is running with a cross, um, and it's intercut with this footage that's supposed to be archival 16 millimeter news footage. Um, and we did sort of grade that together where he had me really make it quite red in the blacks um, and really bloom out the highlights like a, a film bloom kind of thing, uh, uh, you know, film that might have been sitting on the shelf for a while. And then I sent that upstairs to Christopher who put on uh, the uh, scratches and the, the, the dust hits or whatever. And he sent it back to me and then I put a bunch of great color more colorful grain. I used the base light add grain tool, um, and then I did a, a blend, a layer blend uh, in uh, luminance mode to kind of dial back towards the original color and the color of the grain. Um, it's a bit esoteric, but yeah, you can do a lot. 
I mean, inevitably, yeah, and it was the same in both seasons. I mean, season one, I think we had 12, version 12 or something like that of episode one. Uh, whereas ep the last episode, you know, version four was out the door, you know, right, but you get <laughs> because of time. Yeah. And, and, you know, David really likes to control, 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 all right up to the last minute. And it's like uh, nothing is ever good. You really have to say, okay, this is your last round. You're not seeing it anymore. You know, um, and he'll be fine with that, uh, you know. Um, but, yeah, it's inevitably like that. It's probably the same on every show, you know. You always get crunched at the end. And sometimes it's cool to be, like, the last episode, to me, for some reason, we were, it was more rock and roll, but maybe because um, there was a lot more outdoor stuff that um, things just went faster. A lot of these interiors with, these are all, this is a set, you know. Uh, most of the interiors are right on a set. They had huge sound stages in, in Pittsburgh with like maybe four different locations on that set. You know, this office, um, uh, you know, basically there's green screen out those doors, you know. Um, uh, and they did the driving plates uh, are all shot on green screen as well. I did grade the whole thing in the trim pass. It's not that it's an afterthought, but I simply, I don't, I wouldn't have time anyways, even if I had that capability to really spend too much time tweaking the trim, because it's, like I said, David is just such a completist, you know, that he, I'm, I always have a mountain of work to do, you know? So it's hard for me to say, you know what, you probably don't, this, this doesn't concern you, but it concerns me because I have to do this trim, you know? Um, so I need time to do that. And so in a way, maybe it's good that it, my time is, you know, there's not much I can do for the trim pass. Um, we can, however, for example, um, we showed uh, the uh, Mindhunter footage in the big screen today. Um, and so when I, I took that to the Dolby Vine Theater um, in L.A. to do a 108-nit um, pass, all I had to do, because we graded in uh, ACES CCT, was just change the, uh, the ODT to their 108-nit um, and pretty much out of the box, it's looking, it looked amazing, you know. Um, and we did a, a slight sort of gan or black, uh, adjustment of the blacks, but the colors were bang on. And so um, uh, but that's not a trim. That's just repurposing, you know, as ACES, the RRT is designed to do. Um, but yeah, y y you don't want to have to grade two things at once, that's for sure. I'm glad I don't have to.